Hi, and welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith, and in this video, we're going to learn the one to four player game, Sleeping Gods, designed by Ryan Lockett and published by Red Raven Games, who helped sponsor this video. Oh, the year was 1929, and your rugged crew... You know, I don't think anyone wants to hear that voice. And your crew had just set sail from Hong Kong to New York when you found yourselves caught in the worst storm of your lives. When the skies finally cleared, you were lost in unknown waters on an unknown world beckoned by sleeping gods who need your help to be freed, and will then send you back home. Are you up for the challenge? Well, there's only one way to find out. Gather your crew, join me at the table, and let's learn how to play. To set up, you'll open this atlas to the second page. You'll notice islands and different lands and lots of water, and the water is divided into regions by these dotted lines and the binding itself. You now place your ship, the Manticore, into this region with a number two. Nearby, set this shipboard with the side face up for your number of players, which will be indicated here. Three or four on this side, one or two on the other. In this video, we'll set up a two-player game. Also set this port tile and ship action figure nearby. This is the market deck, and from it, you'll find the cards labeled Gloria, Soup, Gear, and Flapjacks. These are the starting items available to the players at the beginning of the game, and you set them face up nearby. The rest of the market deck you shuffle into a face down pile. The cards with these backs are the mild, perilous, and deadly events. Shuffle them separately, dealing six deadly, then six perilous on top, and finally six mild to create an event deck, which is placed here. Any leftovers, you can then return to the box. This is the enemy deck, and their backs are labeled with numbers, which you need to keep in order, so don't shuffle or look through this. This is the ability deck, which you do shuffle and place face down, and these are the level cards. You can examine these anytime you like, so they don't need to be shuffled, and you can even keep them face up if you want. Nearby, in this container, keep the cards labeled as quests and adventures. Never look at these unless instructed, and keep them in their numbered order, as shown on their backs. You can also keep the unused event cards in here as well. Within reach of the players, you'll now want to create supplies for the various tokens. You'll have ship damage cubes, wooden and cardboard damage tokens, which are worth one and five damage. These are the command and combat action tokens. There's also status, explore, fatigue, and coin tokens. The small ones are worth one, and the larger ones are worth five. And here's the dinosaur egg, pollen potion, diving suit, sea serpent, and search tokens, which you shuffle into a pile nearby. There are also resource tokens made up of meat, vegetables, grain, materials, and artifacts. As you've probably noticed, I have my tokens sorted into game trays I have, and if you'd like to get some of your own, you'll find links in the description below. Now take one grain and three coins and add them to your ship's supplies, which are stored on the shipboard here. This is Captain Odessa. You place her board near the ship, and then distribute the rest of the crew as evenly as possible among the other players, along with their related synergy tokens. Then give every player one command token and one ability card. But ability cards you have, you keep private. Next, decide on the first player and give them this captain token. Now, fill in a new log sheet from this pad, writing the date at the top and the names of all the players here at the bottom. Then decide if you're playing on normal or brutal difficulty and indicate that here. I'll explain the difference between these modes in more detail later. Finally, get the big storybook out and place it somewhere within reach. And that's the setup. In Sleeping Gods, you are the crew of the Manticore, a ship lost in an unknown world and unknown sea, but you've come to understand that ancient gods have brought you here to wake them from their slumber by finding the long-lost totems that have been keeping them trapped. In Sleeping Gods, you and the other players will be working together to find the totems so you can complete your quest and return to your own world. The game actually comes with an introductory scenario, which we're going to skip here, but you must play through it in your first game as it gives you the start of the campaign story. And this is a campaign game, but you can play for as long as you like in any one session, and then save the game, and pick right back up where you left off. You can also have players join or leave along the way, or play solo. Sleeping Gods is played over a series of turns, starting with the first player, and then going clockwise around and around the table until the campaign is over. On your turn, you'll hold the captain token and be referred to as the active player, and perform four steps, starting with the ship action. Here, you move the ship action figure to any one of the five labeled rooms and perform the action there. There's a sixth spot, the hall, but you can never go there, and you must always move to a different room from wherever the token had been on a previous turn. 
Now, as we'll see, damage can end up on the spaces by each room, and once a room contains two damage, you cannot go there. Unless all five of the rooms have two damage. In that case, you still have to move the figure to a new room, but you don't get to perform the action there. Speaking of which, let's take a look at the various actions now. Each room shows this command symbol with one or two values, and this is how many of these command tokens that you'll collect from the supply. If you see two values, like we have here, then you collect an amount based on your number of players. For example, this side of the shipboard is for one or two players, so values on the left are how many you collect in a one-player game, and values on the right are what you collect in a two-player game. So in this case, the active player would collect four command tokens, and they would keep them in front of themselves in a personal supply. This symbol represents an ability card, and the value 1 inside of it means that the active player draws one from the ability deck and adds it to their hand. You can never hold more than three ability cards, so if you have more after drawing, discard any extras to a shared ability discard pile. This command symbol with an arrow pointing away from it means you return up to two command tokens sitting on crew members or cards in play back to the supply, and this can even be taken from crew controlled by other players. And we'll see how command tokens can end up in these locations a little later. When you're resolving a room's actions, you can perform them in any order, and the order can matter, because all the components in the game are limited. That means if you run out of something in the supply, you can't take any more of it until some are returned again. Now the exception to that are the damage tokens. But there's a ton of these. You shouldn't run out of them, but if somehow you do, then just use a suitable replacement, like maybe some band-aids, or something else more suitable. Here's an example of why taking actions in a certain order can matter. If there are no command tokens in the supply, I'd want to do this action first just to get some back, so then when I perform this action, I'll then be able to collect something. Any that aren't there, I just won't get to have. Moving on, let's look at the bridge location. Here, you gain an ability card and a certain number of command tokens. But then this symbol means that you return all command tokens that were spent and sitting on components back to the supply. At the gallery, you also draw an ability card and gain a certain number of command tokens. And then this symbol means, if you want, you can discard exactly one ability card from your hand in order to remove one of these fatigue tokens from any player's crew member. And later, we'll learn how fatigue can end up on your crew. If you decide to go to the deck, then after gaining two command, this symbol here means that you may draw up to three search tokens, one at a time. And you can decide to stop or keep drawing as you reveal each one. Once you stop, you then assign any ship damage shown on all of the tokens. These are damage symbols, so in this case, we'd place a total of three damage on our ship. Maybe I shouldn't have drawn so many tokens. Any time your ship takes damage, you draw one ability card per damage that needs to be placed, and then you check the value here and place a damage cube in an empty square of that room. So now I draw for the next cube. And each room can take, at most, two damage, except for the hall, which can only take one. Now, if a room that you draw for already has two damage, you just pick any other room and place the damage there. If the ship ever has all of its damage spaces filled in, you're defeated, which we'll discuss later. And if you're ever told to repair an amount of ship damage, just remove that many cubes from any spots that you like. Back to our deck action, though. Along with any ship damage, if you see any of these low morale symbols, for each one, you assign a matching status token to any crew member, yours or another player's. And we'll talk more about status tokens a little later. That said, with ship damage and low morale resolved on the revealed tokens, if any, you now pick any one of the tokens and collect its rewards. I'm going to pick this one here, which shows a vegetable and meat resource, which I'll take from the supply and add to the ship. These are now available for any player to use. Then all drawn search tokens are put into a discard pile, and if you ever run out of these to draw in the future, just shuffle the used ones into a new pile and keep drawing as necessary. Finally, we have the sick bay, and going here allows you to draw an ability card and gain some command tokens. And then this symbol means that you restore one health to any player's crew member by returning one damage token from their board to the supply. And we'll see how damage ends up on crew a little later. Now keep in mind, the action rewards might be slightly different if you have more players, because then you'll be using the other side of this ship board. Now after you've picked and resolved the ship action, the active player moves to the second step of their turn, resolving an event. And to do this, you draw the top card of the event deck, 
and read it out loud. Sometimes you'll be given a simple action to complete. Other times it will give you options to pick from, and as the active player, you decide which one to perform. Other times you'll be given a challenge you must perform, which will list one of the five crew skills in all caps, like we see here. On the back of the rule book, you'll find the skills with their related symbols. There's craft, cunning, savvy, perception, and strength. To complete a challenge, you can pick any of your crew you'd like to have help participate, but you don't have to pick any if you don't want, and you can still attempt to perform the challenge. Now your crew includes any you were assigned during the setup, and while you're the active player, your crew also includes the captain. If you choose some crew to help, place one of these fatigue tokens on each that are participating. Now, if a member has no fatigue yet, set this face down. If it already has a fatigue token, then place the new one face up. This will make them less effective in combat, as we'll see later. Also, if a crew member already had two fatigue, it can't gain more, meaning it cannot choose to participate in challenges. If any other players want to have some of their crew members help in the challenge, each of those players can pay one command they have, putting it back in the supply, and then each of those players can pick any number of their crew to participate, giving each crew that does one fatigue token. Now look at how many of the required skill symbols these crew members have printed in this area of their boards and on any of their attached ability cards. Now we'll see how abilities end up here later, but let's assume it looked like this. That's one, two, three perception. Now, whether you picked crew to help or not, it's time to draw fate, which means you take the top card of the abilities deck, reveal it, and check the value here, which ranges from one to six, with ones and sixes being half as common as the other values in this deck. You now add this number to your crew's current total. We had three, so that's three plus one for a total of four. However, we needed five. But all's not lost. We can now use crew members' special abilities. Each crew member has two special abilities listed here, and if you spend the command tokens showing to the left of an ability, then you get to perform it. For example, this crew is involved in the challenge, and if its controlling player spends one command, as shown here, then this means that if you draw one as your fate, as we've done here, you get to redraw a new one to replace it. Now you put any command you spend for an ability in this area. Now this crew member cannot perform any of its crew member abilities until any spent command tokens here have been removed. We won't go over all of the crew abilities in this video, but check the back of the rulebook for a guide to all of the symbols. And I should also mention, you can perform crew abilities outside of challenges as well when their effects would apply, even during another player's turn. During a challenge, any player, whether they have crew involved in the challenge or not, can use adventure or market cards like these to help out because they're shared by everyone. For example, we start the game with this item called gear. Any player can pay and place its cost, which is one command, and this is added directly to the card, and then you get to resolve this symbol, which allows us to redraw a new fate card to replace the one we'd drawn previously. And like crew special abilities, you cannot use this effect again until the command token has been cleared from it. In a challenge, you can also use any crew member's equipped abilities. But first, let's see how you get these. At any time, except in the middle of combat or a challenge, you can pay the command cost showing at the top of an ability card that you're holding. And this will allow you to equip it to any crew member, even another player's or the captain. So in this case, the ability here costs two command. I then slide the ability into either of the two slots for abilities here. Now, you can never have more than two abilities equipped to a crew member at a time, but the player who controls a crew member can discard abilities from it at any time they like to make more room. An ability gives that crew member a new skill symbol. So this player now adds two perception to challenges where this crew member participates. The ability also provides this crew member with a special effect they can use during the game. Now, some of these, like this one, will be a one-time use, others are ongoing, and in rare cases, some will require paying a command token to resolve it. Command paid for these effects are returned to the supply rather than being placed on the card, which means that you can use this ability over and over as soon as you wish, as long as you can pay the cost each time. Either way, during a challenge, any player can use adventure or market cards or equipped abilities, even if they didn't assign crew to the challenge. But that's not all. 
Any player can also discard any number of ability cards they are holding that show the skill symbol of the type being tested, and that will add plus one to the final total for each one removed this way. If the final total is equal to or greater than the challenge value, you succeed. Otherwise, you fail and must resolve any fail consequences. But even if you fail, you still gain the listed reward unless the challenge says otherwise. So if we failed here, we'd lose two health, but still get to add one coin from the supply to our ship. When you fail and suffer damage, apply it first as you like to any crew members who participated in the challenge by contributing their skill symbols. Now, if no crew members specifically participated, the active player instead assigns the damage as they like to any of the crew members. When assigning damage, place it as tokens on a crew member's board. And when a crew member has damage equal to their health value as shown here, they cannot take any more. They aren't dead, but they can't attack, participate in challenges, or activate their crew board abilities or ability cards until they regain at least one health. If all participating crew members have zero health, then put any remaining damage on any other crew members, divide it up as you like. And if at any time all the crew members have zero health, the players are defeated, and we'll discuss what happens then a little bit later. Sometimes the result of a failure causes you to gain a Venom, Weakened, Frightened, Madness, or Low Morale status token, and a crew member can have any number of different conditions, but never more than one of the same kind. If an effect tells you to give a status to a specific crew member, and they already have it, then ignore the effect. But if a status is assigned during a challenge, give it to any participating crew member. If none of them can take it, assign it to any other crew member instead. Rather than explain each status and expect you to memorize their effects when you're playing, you can just find them explained here on page 9 of the rulebook. In explaining an event, we also covered spending command, gaining damage, equipping and using abilities, statuses, and most importantly, resolving a challenge. And once a challenge is resolved, discard the ability you drew as fate. And if the ability deck ever runs out, just shuffle its discard pile into a new deck. Normally after an event, you discard it. But if it includes the word ongoing, you place it face up by the shipboard and its effect remains active until you can fulfill its listed condition in order to discard it. So, to recap, on your turn, first move the ship action figure and perform a ship action. Then you draw and resolve an event. Eventually, though, you'll draw the last event from the deck. When that happens the first time, finish that player's turn, and then the next time you would need to draw an event, as it says here beside first time, you read story one. Anytime you're told to read a story section, you turn to the related numbered section in the storybook and read and follow the instructions there. You may have to make decisions, resolve challenges, turn to other passages, and so on. But either way, eventually, you'll be told to return to the ship, which means you put the book away and resume your turn as normal. Now, in this case, when the event deck is empty, it tells us here to go to the book, and this will give us instructions for how to create a new event deck. After you've drawn through the event deck a second time, on the following turn's event, instead, read paragraph 1.2. And if you draw through the entire deck a third time, then the next time you need to draw, you'll read paragraph F1. All right, with that understood, after the event step of your turn is over, you move to step three of your turn, perform two actions. You'll find the four possible actions listed here on the bottom of the shipboard, and you can choose the same action twice if you'd like. You can also choose to skip performing an action and take one command for each one skipped. But let's go through each of these, starting with travel. This lets you move your ship to a new region, which are the water spaces divided by white dotted lines and the spiral of the binder. To travel requires performing a craft challenge, and you don't have to pick a crew member to be involved in this, but if you do, you can only pick a single one, and it must be one of your crew members. But remember, if you're the active player, you can also use the captain. Also, the crew member that you use must have this craft symbol either here or on an attached ability. Whether you use a crew member or not, though, you then draw fate. And if you did pick a crew member to help, add one for each craft symbol that it has. And, as with any challenge, any player can also discard ability cards from their hand with the craft symbol to add one more point each. Now check your final total against this table, and that will tell you up to how many spaces you can move the ship. For example, if your total was seven, you'd be able to move up to three spaces. 
If you move into a space with a hazard, which will look something like this, then you stop and take the related challenge. In this case, it's a strength challenge where you have to get at least five. If you fail, you suffer its penalty. If it shows a damage symbol like this, then you add that amount of damage to your ship. And don't forget, you draw an ability card for each damage place to determine where it goes. But whether you succeed or fail, you can then keep moving after if you still have some more movement points to spend. While traveling, if you get to a map's edge, you can keep going as long as an icon with an arrow like this indicates a new page to turn to. In this case, it says 16. If you want to keep going in that direction, just pick up your ship, turn to the related page, and then enter the map on the opposite side. And if there are multiple regions on that side you could enter into, pick either one of them and put your ship there. Sometimes the edge of a map will show a page number that isn't in your atlas. If so, you need to have the Tides of Ruin expansion, which is sold separately. But you do not need this expansion to play and win the campaign that's included in the core box. This just adds new elements to explore. Next, we have the Explore action. With this, you pick any location that is part of the region you are in. Locations are the circles showing a value like this. For example, while here, we could explore either 2 or 174. You then turn to the related paragraph in the storybook and read it out loud. I want to avoid spoilers for you, so here's an example from the rulebook instead. Now, sometimes, like this, it will give you a choice. You read the choices out loud completely, and then pick what you want to do, resolving any challenges or combat. And combat, we'll learn about soon. Outcomes might take you to other paragraphs to read. But make sure as you flip through the book, you avoid reading any paragraphs you haven't been told to. And you will know when your explorer action is complete, because a paragraph will direct you to return to the ship. And then you close the book and put it away. Some locations have a town or city name. In these cases, the story allows you to select all the choices it presents in the same visit one by one. But you cannot select the same choice more than once during each explore action at that city or town. Sometimes a story option will tell you that you need to have a keyword in order to read it. Keywords are found on quests taken from this box when you're told to. And any keywords will be listed here on the quest. And that means you have it. If you don't have a keyword a story option is asking for, then you can't take that option. If a paragraph says it requires a keyword and you have it, you can still choose a different option unless it says, if you have keyword whatever, then turn to. That means you must turn to that page if you have the keyword. Now, speaking of quest cards, if you're told to lose a quest card or if you're told you completed it, place it in this used quest box that's included in the game. And with that, the explore action is covered. So now let's take a look at the market action. And to perform this, your ship must be in a region with one of these market symbols. You then draw seven cards from this market deck and can purchase any number of them based on their costs here using the coins on the ship's board. Then any cards you didn't buy, you'll place on the bottom of the market deck. Anything you bought other than weapons, which will be identified here, are added to the area beside your ship where they can be used by anyone while playing. Purchase weapons must be attached to this area of any player's crew members. And each crew member can have any number of weapons, and weapons can even be traded, except during combat. Finally, we come to the port action. This requires being in a region that contains a port symbol like this, and then you can perform any or all of the port actions, which you'll find listed here on the port board. At the end, pay four coins to remove one fatigue and restore two health to every player's crew members. At the shipyard, pay any number of material tokens and or coins and repair one ship damage for each. For each coin you pay to the healer, you can fully restore the health of a crew member. And finally, you can spend experience points, or XP, to purchase level cards for any crew members. The cards with this back are the levels, and you can freely look through them at any time, and you'll find some for each crew member. If you want to buy a level, just pay its cost here. The game will tell you when you gain XP, and you record that here in your journey log. Then, as you spend XP, just cross off the related amount. After buying a level, equip it to the related crew member by adding it to an ability card slot. Level cards have a brown border here, which is different than ability cards, and these do not count against a crew member's two-card limit for abilities. And over the course of the game, they can have any number of their level cards. Once equipped, level cards stay on a crew member for the rest of the campaign. And those are all the actions. 
After performing any two, it's then the end of your turn step, where you pass the captain token to the player on your left, and then it's their turn. And now, because they have the captain token, they'll be able to use the captain board as a part of their crew on their turn. Now, in all of this, there is one major thing we have yet to go over. Combat. There are dangers in this world that sometimes just need brute strength to deal with, so let's go back to the table and see how fighting works. When a story section includes the word COMBAT in all caps, followed by a list of numbers, it means you must complete a combat before you can continue. To set the battle up, find those numbered cards in the enemy deck by looking at their backs. For the purposes of this video, I'm creating my own example, but once you've collected the required cards, you shuffle them together, and then you place them into a random row, side by side, with no spaces between them, something like this. Then ensure that each crew member's matching synergy token is sitting on their board. Next, distribute these four combat tokens as evenly as possible among the players. But in a three-player game, always give two to the active player. Also, during combat, if a player wants to give an action token to another player to use, they can, but they must pay one of their command tokens. Now a round of combat begins. Here, one at a time, in any order, players put a combat action token on one of their crew members, and you resolve that token fully before the next one is placed. The only limitation is that a single character cannot have more than two action cubes on their board. After putting a token on a character, pick any one of their weapons to use. Each crew starts with a weapon printed here, but as we saw earlier, they can have other weapons attached to them in this area. You then pick an enemy to attack, and let's say we choose this one. You now draw fate and add that revealed number to the weapon's accuracy, which is represented by the symbol here. So we start with an accuracy of one, we add this three, and that gives us a total of four. In combat, we're trying to meet or exceed the target's defense number, which is shown with this symbol. Otherwise, you miss. So in this case, we need to have at least a five. However, after drawing fate, you may then use any adventure or market cards or crew abilities that can boost accuracy. If you hit, place a number of damage tokens on the enemy card equal to this damage value on the weapon you used. However, if a character has two fatigue, one will be face up, and the face up one means that you deal one less damage. Just keep in mind, while fully fatigued, a crew member can still participate in combat, it just can't participate in challenges. For the example I want to show, let's say I'm dealing four damage. You start on any empty space of the target monster, but then each other one is placed adjacent to another one that you placed during that hit, not counting diagonally. Any shape is fine as long as you don't overlap a space that already has damage. So if I did four damage, I could place it in a T-shape like this, and as you can see, I can even cross from one monster into another one, as long as at least half of the damage rounded up is placed on the original target. This can be a sneaky way to deal damage to a monster with a higher defense than the one that you actually targeted. Let's say it was a future attack and this damage was already on the monster here and I achieved three more damage I could add, but wanted to place one into this space. I could, but the other two damage would be ignored because they can't be placed adjacent to the damage I just added. If a space shows a heart and a value, it means to place a single damage there, you must spend that much damage at once. So let's say we had four damage to assign. I might put one of them here, and then if I want to cover this space, it'll cost me two. So one I would place into the space, and the other I would discard. With one damage left over, I couldn't add to this space because I need two. So I'd have to place it here, 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 or maybe here. Spaces showing a heart represent a monster's life, and if you cover all of its heart spaces, it's defeated. You remove it from the combat, returning it back to its position in the enemy deck, and if this creates a gap between the monsters, slide them to close it. With that, we've seen a few different ways you can assign damage, but let's go back to the point where this crew member had targeted this monster, successfully attacked it, and placed, let's say, these three damage tokens. Whether you hit or miss, the targeted monster will now counterattack, dealing damage equal to its basic attack value, which is shown here, so two in this case, plus any uncovered damage symbols on its card, like we see here. So that's two plus one plus two more for a total of five. However, you then reduce that total by the block value of your weapon, shown here. You may also use block abilities on adventure cards or crew abilities that you might have at this time. And once you have your final total, you place that as damage on your attacking crew member. 
If that attacking crew member has no health left, then place any extra damage on any other crew member of your choice, yours or another player's. But all that remaining damage must be assigned together. You can't split it up. Unless the new crew member you target is also reduced to zero health in the process, then you'd put any remaining on another crew member and so on until all the damage is assigned. Now everything we explained so far assumes that you hit when attacking. If you miss, the target still counterattacks, but then after, you get to deal one damage to them. This is sort of like a little bonus. You didn't do very good in the fight, but you still got a little jab in there somewhere. And you get to deal that bonus one damage to the enemy, even if that particular crew member was defeated during the counterattack. And you can use abilities to boost that one damage that was dealt with your miss. But remember, if you have two fatigue, damage you deal is reduced by one, which is shown here on the face-up fatigue token. So if you miss and don't boost the attack, that one free damage you would normally get to do will be canceled out. You will continue resolving attacks and counter-attacks as each combat action cube is placed. And once all four have been used, it's the end of the combat step where all surviving monsters now attack the crew and activate any of their end of round abilities. You resolve the enemies one at a time from left to right and the active player decides which crew are attacked by each enemy. The damage each enemy does is again equal to the value here plus any of these uncovered damage spaces. But unlike in a counter attack, you do not subtract your block value from that total damage. So here, this monster would do five damage. And again, if the crew member you've targeted for the attack runs out of health while taking damage, the remaining damage must be assigned to a different crew member. If you see a monster space with an hourglass symbol, it means this is an end of round ability and it's resolved now as well after resolving the monster's damage. But you can pick any crew member to be the target of these. It doesn't have to be the same as the one who took the damage from that enemy. In this case, the symbol we see here means a weakness status will be assigned to a crew member. Now, as we mentioned, to defeat an enemy, you need to cover all of its health symbols, but covering its other symbols can be helpful since every covered symbol is ignored. This can reduce how much damage it does or block an end of round ability from resolving. As another quick example, here's a monster with a flying ability. And that means as long as this is uncovered, it has plus one defense against any weapons that do not have this ranged symbol attribute. After the monsters have all attacked and performed any end of round abilities, you check to see if any enemies remain. And if so, all the combat cubes are reclaimed and a new round of combat begins. If the monsters have been defeated, they're returned to the deck and you continue your story in the storybook. One important symbol we haven't covered yet in combat are these small diamond synergy symbols that you'll sometimes find in other symbols' spaces. A crew member that places a damage token on one of these spaces may then give their synergy token to any other crew member. During combat, a crew member with another crew's synergy token may choose to resolve its listed effect here and then it's returned to the original crew member. And these effects can be resolved after fate has been drawn. For example, in this case, to improve the result by two. We won't go over each of the synergy token effects, but you'll find them all explained here in the rulebook on page 25. Just remember, a crew member can't use its own synergy token, just ones it's collected from other players. And at the end of a combat, all synergy returns to its original crew members. Another thing to remember is that a crew member with zero health cannot participate in challenges or in combat until at least one of its health has been restored. And with that, we've covered a lot of the rules, but there are a few odds and ends we still need to go over. Over the course of the game, you'll be instructed to gain adventure cards, which you'll find in this box here. These are numbered, but only look at the ones you're instructed to. Among them, you'll find totems you need to collect, and the more you gain by the end of the campaign, the better your final score will be. Also during the campaign, you'll record information on your log as instructed, and on the back, you'll find a map of the Wandering Seas. It's highly recommended that you write notes on the map to help you remember things about where you've been, where you might want to return to, and so on. Maybe you discovered a spot that needs a certain keyword. Write that down. You'll also use this sheet to save your game if you need to pack it away before you finish the campaign, and if so, follow the steps that you find here to save, and then these steps over here to set it up again. And while playing, you can easily add and remove players during the campaign, and when the campaign is over, you can reset and play it again. But those steps I'll leave for you to discover on your own. 
On these pages, you'll also find some information for calculating your final score at the end of the campaign, as well as clarifications on various abilities you might encounter, so check here if something is unclear while playing. The last thing we should go over, though, is ending the campaign. You'll either survive to the end of your story, in which case you'll be instructed about what to do, or you'll end in defeat. You're defeated either by having all your crew reduced to zero health, or the ship having 11 damage. And remember, at the start of the game, you marked whether you'd be playing in normal or brutal mode. If you're defeated in brutal mode, the campaign just ends and you'll have to restart. However, the game comes with an achievement sheet, and before resetting, you follow the instructions here to mark off what you've accomplished based on the items and totems you collected. Then you use the total to mark off these boxes, which will unlock new quest cards for you to begin with when you start your next campaign. On the other hand, if you're playing in normal mode, the game is more forgiving when you're defeated. In terms of the story, it's assumed your crew gets to a safe place to recover, and then you check off a defeat box on your log. Now, if you were defeated because of the crew's health, move your ship to the nearest port, and then remove all damage and fatigue from your crew. If you were defeated by your ship taking damage, instead move to the nearest port. Don't heal your crew, but remove all damage from your ship. Then, in either of those cases, you'll discard six event cards from the top of the deck and start a new turn. And with that, you're ready to play Sleeping Gods. Now don't forget, at the start of the campaign, you need to play this intro scenario, which will get your story started and provide you with some quest cards. And if you have any questions about anything you saw here, feel free to put them in the comments below, and I'll gladly answer them as soon as I get a chance. But questions about hidden story elements or individual card effects and interactions should be directed to the publisher. You'll also find forums for discussion, pictures, other videos, and lots more over on the games page at BoardGameGeek, and I'll put a link to that in the description below. And if you found this video helpful, please consider giving it a like, subscribing, and clicking that little bell icon so you get a notification anytime we post a new video. But until next time, thanks for watching.